Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Stuart Butler. I'm a senior fellow uh, here at the Brookings Institution, and I want to welcome you all to, uh, to Brookings and to those on the, on the webcast uh, for this discussion on the, on the policy and prospects of budget process reform. And we're pleased to be co-hosting this event uh, with the National Academy of Public Administration, or NAPA. Uh, I just want to remind everybody uh, here that the event is being webcast. So if you'll just take a moment right now to uh, turn off or silence uh, your phones, that would be very, very helpful. Uh, the budget process may seem uh, rather arcane to lots of people. I'm sure it does. Uh, but it's, very, it's critically important to the functioning of our government. Uh, developing a budget in an orderly and timely manner to advance national priorities is a basic function of government. Uh, unfortunately, we've not been very good at carrying out that basic function uh, in the United States. Uh, we're increasingly unable in our budgeting uh, to uh, meet deadlines. We've missed deadlines, uh, which of course impose enormous costs and anxiety to many people who are dependent upon government and to businesses and to organizations that require government support. We seem to uh, move from crisis to crisis and to deadlock. Uh, that's uh, undermined uh, confidence in, in the government itself. Uh, and we've been unable to really address the very basic deep-seated issues uh, in this country that require looking at budgets and changing uh, budgets. I think it's fair to say that this uh, inability to function in this way has uh, contributed to the distrust of government. Uh, we've seen over many years uh, a steady decline in the confidence among Americans that the government in Washington uh, will actually function and, and do the right thing. And of course, it's come to a head in many ways uh, in this election. So I think the failure to actually operate a budget, to develop and design and carry out a budget, uh, is one of the big factors in the uh, deepening distrust of government. Well, over the last two years uh, here at Brookings, we've hosted a series of monthly meetings uh, and roundtables uh, to discuss the budget process reform uh, ideas. Uh, we've brought together budget experts. Uh, we've brought together also political scientists uh, in, this, in these discussions. Uh, the people who've come to these roundtables, uh, the roundtable group, is bipartisan. It represents organizations on, uh, on the left uh, and the right. It includes former officials of the federal government, people who've been very much in the, in the uh, front of uh, the whole budget issue. Uh, including many members of the National Academy of Public Administration have taken part. And many of the organizations that uh, around those tables uh, have been in the forefront of developing ideas to try to deal with the budget process problems that we have. And in fact, you can see uh, both outside uh, in terms of some of the publications, but also on a website devoted to the uh, budget roundtable called budgetingroundtable.com. Uh, you can go on that website and see a number of the papers that uh, we've developed. But it isn't just a question of looking at uh, budget process proposals for reform, but the roundtable has also discussed some of the insights uh, and experiences from political science uh, to suggest ways to actually achieve reform. It's all well and good to have a set of proposals for reform, but one has to spend just as much time thinking about how can we uh, nudge or encourage the political process to actually deliver those reforms. And much of our conversation in the round table has been uh, about precisely that. And we'll be hearing more about that uh, this morning. Uh, today we'll be hearing from two panels uh, reflecting on these conversations and other conversations around town about budget process reform. The first panel will describe some of the leading ideas uh, that have been uh, uh, developed uh, in this area. Uh, the second panel will bring together a, a group of uh, veteran budget experts and uh, political scientists to discuss a little further some of these proposals, but also more importantly, to discuss the experiences and insights from political science that uh, should affect the way we think about the process of reform uh, and, how the, and the prospects uh, for that in the coming months and years. Uh, and now to describe the work of the National Academy of Public Administration uh, in this area and to moderate the first panel, uh, let me hand over to my co-host Dan Blair, uh, who's president and CEO uh, of NAPA.
Thank you, Stuart, for that warm introduction. I'm glad to be here this morning with this august group of budgeteers to discuss strategies and scenarios for successfully reforming the federal budget process. I'm Dan Blair, President and CEO of the National Academy of Public Administration, a congressionally chartered policy institute charged by Congress at advising leaders at the federal, state, and local levels on issues of public administration and governance. The Academy is made up of soon to be 850 plus fellows who range from, who range in the public administration spectrum uh, with the common thread that all are noted for their significant and substantial contributions to the field of public administration. Today we have a number of fellows present both on the panels and in the audience and we also have fellows watching through the live streaming feed. Stuart, I want to thank you and the Brookings Institution for hosting this important conference this morning. As with many aspects of our federal government, our budget processes are in need of updating and reform. For multiple reasons, the 1974 Budget Act seems to have transitioned from a rule to an often ignored suggestion. There seems to be agreement we need a more disciplined and realistic process, but identifying what exactly those new processes should be remains the challenge. Today we have an opportunity to hear from some of our country's leading budget policy experts, and it's my privilege to introduce to you today and moderate the first panel. Joining me today on this first panel are noted budgeteers, Dr. Phil Joyce and Dr. Steve Redburn. Let me briefly uh, give you their bios. Uh, many of you know them in the audience and they are well known in this community. Uh, Phil Joyce serves as a senior associate dean and a professor of public policy in the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Professor Joyce's teaching and research interests include public budgeting, performance measurement, and intergovernmental relations. Phil is the editor of Public Budgeting and Finance and is a past president of the American Association of Budget and Program Analysis and past chair of the ASPA Center on Accountability and Performance. In addition to his work at the University of Maryland, Phil has been on the faculty of the George Washington University, the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse, and the University of Kentucky. Dr. Joyce has 12 years of public sector work experience, including four years with the Illinois Bureau of the Budget and five years with the United States CBO. In 1992, he received the CBO Director's Award for Distinguished Service, and Phil has received his PhD from the Maxwell School, his MPA from Penn State, and his BA from Teal College. Did I correct that? Excellent. Thank you. And importantly, Dr. Joyce is a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. To Phil's right, is Dr. Steve Redburn. He's a distinguished lecturer, budget advisor, and authority on fiscal management and government performance with over 25 years of experience as a senior government official at OMB and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Following his retirement from government service, Dr. Redburn has continued his pursuit about budget policy through serving as a lecturer at GW. Uh, he's the director of fiscal studies for the Centers on the Public Service and an affiliated member of the School of Policy, Government, and International Affairs of George Mason. And in that role, he helps lead research on the federal government's budget processes with other members of the National Budgeting Roundtable. He also served as a project director for the Peterson Pugh Commission on Budget Reform, where he supervised preparation of the commission's report and comprehensive reform of the federal government budget process. Dr. Redbird formerly served as a scholar and study director at the National Academies of Sciences, where he directed a study in conjunction with NAPA of the fiscal futures of the U.S. Steve is a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. He serves on its board and is a member of his executive committee, and he also serves as the board's treasurer. And with that, we will proceed to our moderated discussion. So I've been involved in enough conversations about uh, reforming the federal budget process now to begin to uh, observe certain patterns. Uh, many of them fall into one of two uh, patterns. Uh, many of them start with the lament uh, that the current process is broken. And then they, there's a litany of uh, evidence uh, for that, uh, the failure to uh, pass the uh, budget resolution on a regular basis or the uh, to observe other uh, opportunities to take advantage of other opportunities that are inherent in the uh, Congressional Budget Act, the failure, of course, to pass appropriations by the beginning of the fiscal year in reliance on continuing resolutions and 
most, most years recently, an omnibus that rolls up the uh, remaining appropriations. Um, games of chicken about the uh, raising of the debt ceiling and about uh, enacting a continuing resolution or keeping the government, uh, that would keep the government open. So there's, there's a litany of evidence of that sort. And that leads to discussions about um, reforms that would um, help restore some order, perhaps return to some imagined regular order of the budget process, uh, or at least make the task simpler, um, more streamlined, uh, and therefore easier to, uh, to, to finish. Uh, so we have proposals, for example, for biennial budgeting, uh, which would, uh, at a minimum, uh, cut the number of missed deadlines in half. <laughs> and <clears throat> proposals for automatic CRs or uh, for automatic increases in the debt ceiling and uh, other uh, simplifications of the rules, uh, making it harder to filibuster individual appropriations bills and so on. So that's one kind of conversation. Uh, there's another uh, conversation that starts by asking the question, what is the, the budget process that the nation, a nation like the United States uh, needs to deal with its complex interlocking challenges? to, uh, to uh, look forward uh, long term and sustain the commitments that it has made um, and manages its, uh, its resources uh, eff effectively to address many, many, a uh, growing list always of, of demands on the federal government for action responsibility. Um, Paul Posner and I, and a member that we've drafted for a, as, uh, a, a presidential transition project that is a joint project of NAPA and the Amer American Society of Public Administration. Um, start in that place, that is, what, is, what kind of budget process do we need? What would be its characteristics? And imagine uh, what that endpoint might look like uh, for reform and then uh, recognize at the same time that it's going to take a while to get there, if we ever get there. Um, by the way, this memo is going to be, is one of a set of two dozen that's going to be published next month uh, by that by that project addressing different dimensions of the governance challenge facing the country. So we, at, so we have listed uh, in our memo the, that you have available here today uh, a set of characteristics of a good budget process for the federal government, uh, one that is, uh, we think should be more disciplined, predictable, and institutionalized, uh, that facilitates negotiation and, and compromise, that regularly reviews all elements of the budget, including revenues and spending, that is more forward-looking, uh, giving greater attention both to growth-producing investments and to long-term commitments, that supports uh, stabilizing the debt uh, at a safe level over the, the far horizon. In other words, that, is, uh, that is encourages decisions that uh, produce a sustainable fiscal outlook, but at the same time is neutral with regard to specific policy choices. The process should not uh, be biased toward a particular set of policies, including uh, levels uh, and balance between revenues and spending. And finally, a process that makes more use of evidence, systematic evidence of how alternative resource uses would improve the government's performance in achieving national goals. So in Recognizing that uh, we're not going to get to that kind of a process um, immediately, it probably take many years, and it's not the work of a single administration in Congress. We have some proposals for the new president in Congress to consider, uh, some steps that could be taken in that direction. And one of these is to budget for national goals, to make room in the process uh, annually for considering a small number, maybe a handful of major national policy objectives, uh, and doing a deeper analysis of those. Um, inevitably and necessarily, the, the, the process is, is always going to be primarily focused uh, incrementally on marginal choices. That is, should we increase spending for this program? Should we cut that program? Should we tweak this or that policy? Uh, the, the process is also going to be, for the most part, uh, as it is now, um, somewhat myopic, looking primarily at the next year, the budget year, uh, rather than farther ahead. And it's, it's, uh, it's going to be stovepiped uh, or siloed. That is, <coughs> that is it's organized, the decision making is organized by agencies, departments, and their programs for the most part. And it's also siloed in the sense that uh, decision making about revenue policy, tax policy is separated in the process from decisions about spending. 
but we propose to uh, make room in the process for a deeper analysis, as I've said, of current uh, federal policies uh, for ma a few major national policy goals each year. And if there's time uh, later in the Q&A, uh, maybe we can talk more about how this would work in detail. But the idea is, in, in a nutshell, uh, to uh, identify a portfolio of policies that includes both spending and tax expenditures, that uh, is spending through the tax code, uh, and regulations and other policies that are associated with each of these major policy goals that tend to cut across agency jurisdictions, committee jurisdictions, and Congress. And then to, uh, through the uh, work of the Budget Committee and the Budget Resolution, direct uh, GAO, CBO, others to analyze um, these uh, portfolios, uh, and which constitute essentially the implicit strategy of the federal government today to try to achieve a given policy objective, in comparison to alternative strategies that might uh, help us identify breakthrough gains in productivity and the use of resources for achieving that goal, and might also identify budget savings. So that's the idea is to make room in the process then for portfolio analysis and uh, deeper analysis that would lead to uh, recommendations in the budget resolution in the following cycle uh, for review and decisions uh, about that policy area. So a second set of recommendations has to do with the budget committees uh, and, strength and, and inter introducing this kind of an approach into the current process would imply stronger role for the budget committees. I'm not going to say much about this because Phil has written about this and is going to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> but we see them providing leadership and direction shaping this and working through the uh, budget resolution and reconciliation to, to help make it happen. Third, uh, we recommend establishing a multi-year framework and process for the budget with targets for revenues and spending uh, and for budget savings. Uh, this has become the norm in Europe and other uh, and around the world, really, uh, to have a multi-year um, framework within which annual budgeting is done. And again, Phil has written extensively about this, and I'm, so I'm going to defer to him, let him talk about that when he gets, gets the mic. Um, the fourth step that we recommend is to uh, regularly review and budget for tax expenditures and mandatory programs, uh, which are now sometimes said on autopilot. Uh, to make them uh, subject to regular, if not annual, review and to require such reviews in the budget resolution to develop more evidence about the effectiveness of tax expenditures that could be brought to bear in this kind of analysis, including the portfolio reviews, and to consider adding uh, the totals for tax expenditures to both the revenue and spending sides of the budget to provide a, a, uh, a more accurate uh, presentation of the true scale of, of, of the budget, uh, they, the revenue losses from tax expenditures annually are roughly equal to those uh, for, to the spending through appropriated programs. So this would raise both revenues and spending by equal amounts and, without changing the deficit calculation. And that would certainly highlight the need to give them more attention. And we pr propose for mandatory programs a regular process of review. Uh, that includes uh, setting uh, longer-term caps or targets, um, which would, uh, if they were not met, uh, require Congress to take some action to address um, that overage. So that's, that's part of that recommendation. And then finally, uh, we propose a review and revisiting of, of budget concepts. The last time there was this, uh, a full review of the basic concepts that are used in the budget process and how they are applied was in the 1967 when the President's Commission gave us the uh, set of uh, budget concepts that we largely uh, adhere to today. But there's a, uh, a long list of uh, potential uh, issues and agenda uh, for, for a commission that, uh, of the Congress and the President perhaps together uh, to take a fresh look at uh, the scope of the budget, how we define spending and and revenues and many other issues that seem like they're dry and technical but can have major impacts on the way the, the decision-making process is framed and set up. Uh, and Rudy Penner and Barry Anderson have written uh, for the National Budgeting Roundtable about this. And you can read their paper if you want, want to get an idea of what the agenda of such a commission might be. So those are some steps that we think would help us move the nation toward a, a, a process that would better serve its needs. Uh, 
Thank you, Dan, and thank you, uh, Steve. Um, good morning. I'm I'm very happy to be here. I uh, I've been following more earnestly, perhaps than many, uh, budget reform ideas for about the last 25 years. In fact, when I was at CBO in the uh, first part of the 1990s, it was actually my job. Uh, I, um, I was introduced once to an external visitor by one of our macroeconomists and, uh, who, who said, this is Phil Joyce. He follows the budget process. We're glad he does because otherwise we would have to. Um, so, uh, you know, so uh, there's a lot of these reform ideas that we're talking about that have been around for a while. Uh, there are some that are, uh, that are relatively new. Uh, but there's a reason, I think, that we've been focusing a lot on budget process reform in the last couple of years, and I'll get to that uh, later. But first, I want to uh, talk about the ideas themselves and, and start out by talking about uh, these two reform ideas that Steve alluded to uh, that I've been doing some work on, and second, uh, talk explicitly about the activities of the House and the Senate, where both of the budget committees have been focusing uh, in quite a lot of depth on budget process reform uh, in, the, in, the last, uh, in the last year. So first to a couple of reform ideas I've been focused on. Uh, the first that I've been talking about and writing about for about 10 years is really focused on strengthening the budget committees. And the reason uh, I think that this is important is you have to go back to the, uh, the original aims of the 1974 Budget Act. And, and frankly, I think there were two big ideas in the 1974 Budget Act. One big idea was CBO, and the other big idea was the budget resolution, uh, because the budget resolution was the key vehicle through which the Congress was to articulate its priorities. And in fact, in order to do what Steve just suggested, which is to focus uh, more explicitly on entitlement spending, tax expenditures. Really, at this point, the budget resolution is the main vehicle through which that would happen. Uh, and the notion here, I think, is powerful, which is that in the absence of an articulation of an overall fiscal policy, congressional budgeting is simply the accidental and haphazard result of whatever laws happen to pass in a given year. And here, I think the budget committees used to be quite influential. When you think back to people like Pete Domenici and Leon Panetta, they were powerful members of Congress, and they helped to shape national fiscal policy. But the budget committees, I think, have been weakened in recent years, and this is in no small part uh, to, due to the fact that the budget resolution has become a sort of hit-and-miss proposition. In fact, over the past 16 years, including this one, We've only even passed a budget resolution seven times. The budget resolution, as you know, is supposed to be agreed to by the House and the Senate. Now, in many years, that's because the House passed one and the Senate either did not or there could not be an agreement reached between the House and the Senate. But this year, in fact, both the House and the Senate failed to pass a budget resolution. And as near as I can tell, it's the first time in history that the House didn't pass a budget resolution. So my notion here is that the budget committees would be stronger and taken more seriously if they explicitly included members of the congressional leadership. Uh, this is an idea that's actually been around since the, uh, since the late 1980s when former Senator Nancy Kassebaum suggested something similar to this. Uh, I would rename the committees Committees on National Priorities and I would include the chairs and ranking members of major committees in the House and Senate. And ideally, I think this would be part of a larger reform of the committee structure, and I would go as far as to say that we might consider combining the authorization and appropriations committees. But even if that's not going to happen, and it's probably not, uh, I think reform of the budget committees themselves might be possible. Second, as Steve suggested, I've been focused on encouraging a longer-term approach to budgeting. There's no question that the problems that we face are long-term in nature and therefore they require long-term solutions. And in fact, uh, again, as Steve suggested, it's a budgeting best practice internationally to think about policy not in single year terms but across multiple years. Uh, despite the fact that the federal government is uh, the largest and most complex institution, I would say, in the world, uh, not only does it not focus on multiple years in its budget process, it doesn't even do annual budgeting well. So I would say, you know, a step in this direction would be actually to do an annual budget and do it on time, but let's go beyond that and, uh, and start to think more specifically about some ideas that might uh, focus more on the long term. And these include 
an explicit focus on fiscal rules and targets, greater attention in the President's budget and Congressional budgeting on the multi-year effect of policies, and encouraging the public and the press to focus on the long term as opposed to perhaps uh, the, the deficit number in a single year. Uh, the ideas that we presented so far, Steve and myself, uh, are ones that largely came out of the Napa Project or the Budgeting Roundtable, but these two organizations are not alone in seriously considering budget process reform. Organizations like the C Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, the Bipartisan Policy Center have also engaged in budget reform uh, efforts. Now in all of these cases, what they have in common is that lots of the usual suspects, and by this I mean academic budget experts or people who've occupied high-level budgeting positions are the people who have been involved in, the, uh, in these conversations, and frankly, I see many of them in the room. Um, <clears throat> but I have to, and I have to say that all of these are serious efforts, but it's not unusual for people like us, and when I say people like us, I of course mean budget geeks, uh, to talk about budget process reform. What is more unusual is the level of attention that budget reform has gotten in the Congress this year, largely through the substantial public record compiled, compiled by the House and Senate Budget Committees. Since late July of 2015, the House Budget Committee has held, by my count, eight hearings featuring 29 witnesses on budget process reform. And the topics discussed have included first principles of budget reform, restoring the congressional power of the purse, biennial budgeting, controlling mandatory budgeting, fiscal goals, budget enforcement, I could go on. At the conclusion of this, the committee articulated five principles of budget reform. One, exercise constitutional government. Two, promote and sustain fiscal responsibility. Three, restore congressional control of spending and taxation. Four, improve oversight and facilitate orderly decision-making. And five, reflect the true cost of programs. And I would submit that while people might disagree about the specific definition of each one of these things, many people who would focus on budget process reform would agree with these principles. In fact, Chairman Price has pledged a total rewrite of the 1974 Budget Act, and the, and the committee, and I, I would encourage you to go to their website, has published a number of thoughtful papers summarizing current challenges and presenting reform ideas. The Senate has also been busy. Chairman Enzi and the Senate Budget Committee, in a six-month period commencing in October of 2015, also held eight hearings, and those hearings featured 25 witnesses and focused on many of the same issues that were addressed by the House biannual budgeting, regulatory budgeting, budget control. Uh, a June 2016 document, which I also commend to you, summarized without specifically endorsing lots of ideas coming out of these hearings. Some of these are ones that we've already discussed, Budget Concepts Commission, focusing on tax expenditures, for example. But there are many others, and I'll just list them but not elaborate on them, just to give you an idea of the scope of the ideas that are being considered. Making the budget resolution a law requiring the President's signature. Again, creating a biennial budget process. Ending voterama, which for those of you who know about the Senate, is a meaningless exercise in the Senate where senators consider amendments to the budget resolution pretending that they're making policy when they're really just scoring political points. Addressing the chronic problem of late appropriations, either by imposing consequences for them or by providing for automatic continuing resolutions. Creating a capital budget eliminating baseline budgeting, and reforming how we budget for disasters. This is only a partial list. There were more, uh, more in, this, uh, in this memo. So finally, why all this attention to budget reform? I think there are two main reasons. First, there is the reasonable consensus that budget outcomes, whether we are talking about procedural outcomes or substantive outcomes, are a mess. Faced with this reality, it's easy to blame the process. I won't go into detail on this except to say that it's been my observation over many years that uh, it's easier to identify problems than it is to devise solutions. In fact, uh, the fact that there are uh, a lot of problems with the budget process does not necessarily mean that the next idea that any of us have might be the, the solution. So I think it's important to be careful uh, that we don't do more harm than good. Second, I think there is a good explanation for all of this congressional attention to budget reform. I think it became clear to both the House and Senate Budget Committees that they were not going to be able to pass a budget resolution this year. And faced with that reality, there were two options. One option was to close up shop for the year. A second option was to figure out how to productively use the time. 
I certainly don't fault the budget committees. In fact, I commend them for using the time that was available to them to focus on budget reform. And while some of us may not, and I do not, agree with more or some of these ideas, it's undeniable that both the House and Senate have made serious efforts at collecting and analyzing budget reform ideas, and that there might be payoff from this later on, if and when the moon and the stars align for budget reform. The problem at that point will be taking this laundry list, figuring out which ones would genuinely represent improvements, and then working to get the political system <clears throat> excuse me, to accept these ideas. And certainly that's something we'll be hearing about in the second panel. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, Steve. Why don't we start off with a question for the panel up here, and then we'll go to the audience and engage the audience. Both are honing in on Congress. Congress is also within the executive branch. You'll need what makes next year <clears throat> next year uh, will be the first time that under the. Uh, GPRA Modernization Act, uh, the agency, the executive agency's processes of developing new strategic plans and strategic objectives will be synchronized with the electoral, uh, presidential election cycle. Uh, so there will be an opportunity f uh, for Congress and the President to use that, uh, s that work uh, to set an agenda for major uh, policy reviews such as we talked about under the heading of portfolio budgeting. Um, so I could imagine next year a new president, cons uh, presidential administration, uh, at a high level consulting with Congress about what the major policy priorities might be, not with the idea that they're going to agree on solutions, but that they might want to identify um, policy problems that are ripe for analysis. At, at a lower level, GPRA requires uh, agencies to consult with uh, Congress as they develop their strategic objectives. And uh, that is something that has not been well organized, uh, but the budget committees could help organize that process. Um, so in other words, GPRA has given uh, an opportunity to Congress and the administration to focus on major policy goals and how to achieve them and to build that into the budget process. Um, or you could imagine that the leaders of the House and the Senate on their own initiative could uh, and working through the budget committees could select some targets uh, for in-depth review. And then if that is done over the first year of new administration, in this, uh, and they might also draw on the work of GAO, by the way, on fragmented overlapping duplicative programs in, in selecting those policy areas for review. If those reviews are conducted in, over the next few months, uh, perhaps with the help of CBO and GAO to do the analysis, or with the help of a congressionally chartered organization like NAPA, for example, um, to convene a panel, um, then the, the fruits of that could be used to inform the budget resolution for fiscal year 2019, uh, which would be the first full-fledged uh, budget on the regular uh, timetable for the new administration. So that's one way I could imagine this unfolding. And then the, the budget resolution could implement the, the findings of those reviews. Uh, I would just add a couple things. I, I would say first, um, you know, to talk about the elephant in the room, uh, it may matter who the president is. Um, but uh, leaving that aside, I think that we, um, I, I think that uh, history would tell us that uh, there's more chance of uh, things happening in terms of sort of legislative efforts in odd numbered years than even numbered years. Uh, and that the first year of a new presidential administration is, is often because it's a further distance away from the next election uh, is often a good time, you know, to focus on these things. Now, you know, having said that, political polarization is a real thing, uh, and so we shouldn't sugarcoat it. We'll, I'll leave this to the second panel, but I think we should not uh, uh, imply that this is going to be an easy thing to do. Uh, because all reforms, whether they're policy reforms or process reforms, inevitably create winners and losers, uh, and so there will be calculations in terms of, uh, of who is in which camp. Why don't we go to the audience at this point? We have two mobile mics, Ali over here, back there, so 
questions from the audience. If you have a question and you're recognized, please identify yourself. Morning. I'm Stan Collender. I write for Forbes. I teach at George, uh, Georgetown, and I'm a longtime observer on the budget process. Um, Phil, I'm going to direct my comments at you, but you're both welcome to address them, and they're going to be a little strong. And I apologize. All right. I'm astounded at what I think is I'm going to call academic naivete. Uh, you gave great credit to the budget committees for holding hearings on a budget process that they refused to implement. What makes you think that any new rules would be any more, imp they'd be more, any more interested in implementing new rules than they are in the existing rules? Or why don't you give credit to the fact that they could do whatever, they, whatever you wanted them to now, they've got all the power they want, they just refuse to do it. So what makes you think that process changes of any kind are gonna get this Congress or the next Congress or the Congress after that to do something they don't wanna do? Well, let me, let me start by saying that I think you know, because you and I sat next to each other and testified before the House Budget Committee, that it is my view that the problem that we have is not primarily a problem with the budget process. That is, I think we have a larger uh, political problem, and uh, I think the budget process, uh, people who think that this is about a failure of the budget process uh, are, I think, focused on the wrong thing. In fact, I... Um, I testified a few years ago with uh, Jim Nussel, the former chair of the Budget Committee, Republican chair of the Budget Committee, and, uh, and his uh, advice to the House Budget Committee was, before you decide the budget process is broken, you might want to try it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and so, uh, and so my, um, my view is not that they couldn't pass a budget resolution if they wanted to, or that even there's a sort of fundamental problem with the structure of the budget process. I think the budget resolution is actually quite a useful device when it is used effectively. All I'm saying is that I think that it is, it seems quite likely to me that the failure to pass a budget resolution this year was beyond the control of the budget committees themselves. And so given that they could not control whether uh, whether the House could pass a budget resolution and, and in the Senate, whether the Senate could pass a budget resolution that, you know, deciding to just sort of not do anything at all uh, was an inferior choice to me to thinking about how the budget process might, might be changed. Would I think it was better if they had actually passed a budget resolution? Yes, I would think it was better. Uh, it, would be, it seemed clear that that was not going to happen. And so given that that was not going to happen, how might they have productively used their time? I think they used their time quite productively under the assumption that the most productive use of their time would be to actually operate the budget process. It's been my uh, observation that <clears throat> when uh, the Congress and the President are actually focused on budget policy, they don't talk about the budget process. They only talk about budget process reform when they're not really focused on the on the the budget process, using the budget process itself, I'll just add briefly that <clears throat> certainly reforms are not going to be enacted or adhered to until uh, political leaders think it's in their political interest to do so. Um, with the <clears throat> reputation of Congress <clears throat> at a, a historic low, I could foresee a time when. A majority in the Congress might decide it's in their political interest to uh, to try to fix the process so it yields <coughs> better fiscal choices. Excuse me. You both yeah. kind of laid out very ambitious <coughs> reform agendas, mm -hmm. but we always know that we're, an ambitious ag agenda can sometimes collapse because of its own weight. So realistically, do you think it's the best idea to go big, or do you think it should be go, go <coughs> small and incrementally? And what are your thoughts on that? Um, so, you know, I think that we've seen success in, you know, in sort of both kinds of reforms. I think the, the odds of going, going big are probably greater if the budget process changes were actually tied to some kind of a major budget policy agreement. I mean, this is what happened, for example, in, uh, 
in, in 1990. So, you know, do, do I think that there will be a major standalone, you know, <coughs> rewrite the process from the ground up uh, budget process reform? Uh, probably not. And I think absent, you know, some big reconciliation bill that deals with issues of budget policy, which then might have as one of its titles some kind of a budget process reform, we probably won't see going big. Uh, you know, other than that, I think you're likely to see if there are particular issues, uh, incremental issues that get attention, they might be attached to one piece of legislation or another. I would agree with that. I think the progress is going to be incremental <clears throat> toward the kind of budget process we need. But at the same time, I think it's important, as I said, to have at the outset a vision of where you want to end up, what kind of process you want to ultimately uh, move toward and how the pieces fit together in some integrated fashion. So you have to have some sort of concept of where you're headed uh, to help separate uh, the reform ideas that, uh, that are not going to be so productive <coughs> from others. Uh, you said there's a laundry list of ideas out there, and I think you need some model or, or vision to help separate the wheat from the chaff as you go forward. <coughs> Questions from the audience? Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Peter Gluck, and I'm a professor emeritus of political science and public administration, and I've done a fair amount of work in budgeting. Um, I want to just echo the comments of the previous questioner, because I think the problem is much less a function of budget reform than it is the willingness of the current participants and even previous participants to follow the system that's already in place. So when you sign a letter that commits you to not raising taxes, or you say there are no consequences to failing to raise the debt ceiling, this suggests that no reform is going to work any better than the current system. And if you rescinded those things, then the current system would work, probably work pretty well. Uh, I, would, I would just add uh, that, you know, I, I'm, I've become fond of... Um, of quoting Herb Stein, who was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, I believe under President Nixon, and he said basically, you know, there are, there are two ways to improve budget outcomes, better people and better information. And since he didn't know how to get better people, that budget process reforms had always been focused on information. And I think if you look at a lot of the budget process reforms out there, they really are focused a lot on getting better information to the participants. My own view is that we've never had better information than we have now. Uh, and the budget outcomes procedurally or uh, from a policy standpoint are worse. Uh, and so uh, I agree with you that this is mostly a political problem, not a budget process problem. I think that you know part of the reason, frankly, in the, even in the organization of this event, that the second panel is sort of following up and talking about politics and that a lot of discussion in the budgeting roundtable has been around political issues is a recognition that this is not, it's not a technical uh, budget process problem. It is, uh, you know, it may, there may be some budget process problems, but they're wrapped up in this larger political uh, problem, which has to do with, uh, with uh, you know, pol political polarization, I think, more than anything else. And if you can't do anything about that, then no sort of tinkering at the margins with budget process reforms is going to get you very far. Hi, I'm Lisa Driscoll, and I uh, am a budget technician at the uh, Office of Management and Budget. And to speak to the point about politics, I want to get away from that and ask if you have recommendations in terms of presentation, in terms of the information you're talking about, uh, and how we can present things that are not budget process reform per se, but the ways that we can assist in helping those decisions get made. All right. So, well, so you know, I think one is you know there are a couple of things. Uh, one of one that Steve um, uh, alluded to, which is I think moving tax expenditures more sort of front and center into the process is a very important idea. I think tax tax expenditures 
are relatively invisible compared to spending, even though they do effectively the same thing. If you give somebody a benefit through the tax code or you give it through a spending program, what difference does it make? It's a whole lot more transparent at this point what happens on the spending side than what happens on the tax side. I also think that considering whether we want to expand uh, accrual concepts as happened under the Credit Reform Act of 1990, you know, to other parts of the budget where we may be making long-term commitments, but where the immediate cash <coughs> outlay is not a very good indicator of the of the sort of long-term cost to the federal government is also something uh, worth exploring. But I think what both of those have in common is making transparent the actual cost of something when you're making a, a decision about. <coughs> that's, that's a good list. Uh, um, I would add to it, uh, isolating uh, and separating investments uh, from other spending and tax expenditures in the budget uh, so that there's a separate category of investments as opposed to programs where the consumption is of the, the benefits are generated almost immediately. That would highlight and focus attention on those uh, kinds of spending and tax expenditures that could perhaps, perhaps drive economic growth and otherwise create a stream of long-term social benefits, and they, <coughs> they might want to get uh, more attention. Uh, and I agree that they could be, uh, this is another opportunity perhaps to provide an accrual treatment uh, of some sort to that set of investments. But there are a lot of issues to be dealt with, perhaps by a Budget Concepts Commission before that's, that's done. <coughs> I think in general, the President's budget would be a better document if it presented more clearly um, how the resources that are uh, resource decisions were guided by uh, choices about the major policy priorities and how to how best to achieve those. So I would reorganize the material in the, the budget uh, so around major policy objectives to the extent possible. Rearranging those. Are we also talked about transparency. It puts out what every two. or another body bring about Well, I think the most important thing to do, and, and this is why I really like uh, Steve and Paul's idea of portfolio budgeting, I think the most important thing to do is to make transparent what the different tools and choices are that we are making around a given policy area. I mean, right now, frankly, what gets in the way of that as much as anything is the organization of the Congress, the fact that, you know, tax ideas are under the jurisdiction of one committee, mandatory spending under another committee, appropriations un under another committee. And one of the reasons that you could bring all that sort of front and center, uh, not only in the President's budget, where it clearly could be done now, but in the, but in the budget resolution, is because these are the places where uh, all spending and taxes are sort of being considered uh, at the same time. So anything that would better inform those trade-offs among the different choices of policy tools in a, in a given uh, policy area, I think would be a step forward. Hi, Harry Stein with Center for American Progress. I wanted to go back to an earlier point, the um, distinction between better people and better information. I thought that was really interesting. Um, one of the most common ideas that you hear in budget process reform is to set some sort of cap on either spending, deficits, taxes, usually mandatory spending, and then enforce that with automatic triggers. That doesn't seem to fit into either better people or better information, so I'm not sure if there's a third category or maybe it does fit into one of those two. But where do you see those, those kinds of proposals fitting into the landscape? Thank you. All right, well, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assert that um, there, are, you know, there are two kinds of people in the world, people who believe in triggers and people who don't. And, uh, and I'm going to say I'm one who doesn't. And, uh, and the reason I don't is because I think they only work if they're actually a reflection of a broader consensus that we already have around doing something. That is that uh, I actually think this is not an area where we're just sort of speculating. I think we actually have a lot of evidence going back to Graham Rudman or even to the Budget Control Act of 2011 that simply setting targets and even imposing some apparently draconian uh, uh, consequence for not meeting those targets 
is not sufficient if the people who are having to make the decisions that would involve inflicting actual pain on actual people at that moment are not willing to do that, if instead they're willing to say, well, we didn't mean it when we, uh, when we set the targets. So this is back to a sort of broader theme uh, that, uh, you know, I, I didn't mention, but you've given me an opportunity to mention it now, which is that what the budget process is good at and what the budget process is not good at. And I think the budget process is not good at forcing people to make decisions that they do not want to make it is pretty good at enforcing compliance with decisions that have already been made, but only as long as that consensus uh, remains. So, you know, that's sort of what we learned even with the Budget Enforcement Act uh, of, uh, of 1990, that the, you know, the caps in the PAYGO system held as long as there was still a consensus around that, but frankly, when there became budget surpluses, you know, that consensus began to unravel, and at that point, uh, we uh, we just sort of uh, went back to to kind of you know what what happened prior to that. <clears throat> I believe Trigger was Roy Rogers' horse. Um, <laughs> I, <clears throat> having uh, agreed w with virtually everything Phil just said, I would I say it's partly an empirical question uh, whether triggers uh, and caps can be effective as a discipline, and we have a, a more recent test than the BEA in the Budget Control Act. And I would argue that <clears throat> there has been continued downward pressure on part of the budget uh, from those caps, even though there's been some relief, um, and the enforcement of them by potentially by, by sequester. So there's, um, I, I'd say that, <clears throat> that they can have their uses temporarily, but they are only sustainable as long as there's political will to adhere to an agreement that uh, has been set in advance. Yes, sir. Someone else mentioned, Larry Checo, somebody else mentioned it before, but um, it seems to me that part of the real problem here is that um, how could you have a budget resolution when hundreds of guys on the Hill have already signed a pledge not to raise taxes? It's my understanding that all these folks can do is spend and raise taxes. And if they've given up half of that equation, how do you move? Uh, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure that's a question that needs an answer. But uh, but I you know but I but I do think that uh, you know this is all part of this you know what I would call sort of the vanishing middle. I mean there you know I mean political scientists you know these guys know better than I do. But there's essentially you know in the Venn diagram that you know is the sort of common ground between Republicans and and Democrats. At this point, you know, the, the Democrats have moved further to the left and the Republicans have moved further to the right. And I will say that many of the Democrats are as opposed to making changes to entitlements as the Republicans are opposed to, to raising taxes. They haven't signed a pledge, but it doesn't mean that they don't sort of think in that way. And I think that's the big challenge is, you know, since, since a, the magnitude of the problem is such, that we would need to do both of these things, in my opinion. We would need to both raise taxes and, and get control over entitlement spending. If you have one party that it refuses to do one and the other party refuses to do the other, it's very difficult to, you know, to get to where you need to go, which is why there's all the attention on discretionary spending, uh, which is not really much of the problem. You know, that there's a lot of people that want to control discretionary spending and they don't want to talk about the, the two places where really you could make a big difference, which is entitlement spending and, and taxes. In, in international diplomacy, there are techniques that allow people to reach agreement on particular actions without abandoning their commitment to their, their principles, such as not increasing taxes. And when there was a center in 1986, there was a tax reform that uh, lowered rates uh, but eliminated a lot of the tax expenditures or loopholes in the code. So I could envision perhaps something like that coupled perhaps with some increased uh, attention to investments, long-term investments in the budget uh, as a basis for an agreement that would allow people to step away from their hardened positions, but not necessarily anytime soon. I'm uh, Rick May with the House Budget Committee and I rise reluctantly, but when Stan Collender stands up, I usually have to stand up, too. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Phil for the very nice comments about the Budget Committee. Uh, we worked really hard this year on budget process reform hearings, and, and both uh, Steve and, and uh, Phil were part of that. 
I think from our experience, the example why the budget resolution didn't pass this year was because of spending, had nothing to do with taxes, uh, because there's a lot of still sort of political angst over the budget agreement that was reached uh, last fall. So that, it was really a spending problem. This is not really a question, but it's what we discover is that many of the members, as much as we try to educate members, they d either do not understand the process or they see no ramifications for not doing the process. So is there anything that we can do, you, we, the collective we can do to help educate, help the budget committee educate members and try to under, explain to members what the essence of the process is and that there are ramifications for not doing something? Well, I mean, you know, in, in, in one sense, I think you, you did it, but I think you have to figure out how to broaden it beyond just the budget committees. I mean, you know, I, I would argue that the budget committee members in both the House and the Senate are more educated on the budget process now than they were a year ago just as a result of all of the sort of parade of people that came before them. But they're still only a small number. And so, you know, my, uh, my challenge to you would be sort of how do you expand that, you know, to better sort of educate the, uh, the rank and file. And I'll stop there because it says stop right there. <laughs> we have a hard stop. And uh, I greatly appreciate your questions this morning and the opportunity to be here with uh, the panelists. We're going to have just a very short transition to the next panel. And moderated by Stuart Bob.